One bit of administration. Um, has everybody signed the register? Because you're in a wrong room, make sure when you leave that these registers are signed. Make sure um, you get the right one. And yeah, one's my group and one's uh, um, Ron's group. So I'm just going to leave them there. There's no need to rush, but don't leave the room without signing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. How, how do you think of an organisation like Cywell? If you've got friends who are accountants or family members who are accountants, when they qualify, they qualify and become a member of their professional organisation, and as a result, they get a professional qualification. We're exactly the same in the way we operate, only people that join us come from the water and environment sector. And so they could be working in a huge number of roles and backgrounds and experience right across the environment sector, dealing with water issues, flood, flood risk management. Um, they could be working on con contaminated land, energy resource, energy management issues, environmental issues. Um, one of the things that we do as an institution is when they join us, they get a professional qualification. Um, you'll hear the term chartership. Um, we're an organisation that um, operates under bylaws, and those bylaws are, are, are registered to the Privy Council, and so we have what's known as a charter. So the charter allows us to give a professional qualification. We have a, we have our own professional qualifications and in, in, in institution, and Tom will mention that. And also, we charter people who are engineers, scientists, and environmental professionals. We're predominantly UK based, but we do have members that stretch across about 90 countries in the world. Um, some of those it's only one or two people, and in others it's, it's a, a few hundred. And one of the things that we're trying to do as an organisation is look at where we go in the future. So what, what do we do? How do we develop and grow as an organisation? And what sorts of things do we do going forward? that meet the needs not just of our members, but people who might be potential members. Um, we accredit university courses, so we work with students. We have initiatives that link into education at the school level. We run the water in the initiative aimed at schools. And we go all the way through to postgraduates, to people in industry, all the way through from when they start in their early 20s until they retire. Um, part of why there's a high turnover rate is the members of our institution, there's a bias towards those who are 50 to 65. So one of the challenges we have is how do we get people interested in those at the younger end of the spectrum. Um, I'll let Tom run through a few slides now. Um, yeah, I'll let Tom run through a few slides now. It's not average at members of age. Um, what we recently we did um, some statistics of where the age range of our members lie. And it's in the charter level, which is the professionally qualified level, it's further up the age scale. In terms of what the average age is, it, it's probably not quite that high, but it's getting that way. Um, so it's really looking at getting people in, new into the industry um, and developing from there. Yeah. Well, I, I'm Tom, I, um, I work, work for Paul, my director. Um, and I'm from the opposite end of the country originally, I'm from Southampton, um, as a Southampton fan. 
Um, it's been a good season game in the Premier League. Um, I don't know why we always go back to football, but um, it tends to be uh, the international language, um, I guess, in some ways. Um, we've got a few slides um, to, to give some idea of where we are and what we actually do in a bit more depth um, than you know, the Paul's just been given. Um, one of the things we have is we have a president annually, um, and the, the president that came up with the quote that's on the screen here um, was actually head of flood risk management at the Environment Agency. So one of our really strong areas is flood risk management. Um, and he said, Simon is a natural home for all environmental professionals. Um, and one of the reasons we say that is we don't just have engineers that work in flooding. We also have scientists who will test air pollution indoors and outdoors. Um, we'll also have someone who will um, go to a river and test the water quality. So if you could think of a role that would have an environmental element to it, one of our strengths is that we've probably got a member in there. Um, another way of describing it was another past president said we had members from A to Z in the, uh, in, in the alphabet. We have accountants through to zoologists, so we do have people coming into membership with accountancy degrees and zoology degrees. And I have actually seen both now, so um, I can say that quite, quite confidently. Um, to give a broader understanding of where we work, um, we don't just have um, member benefits. We also do things for the public good and public benefit. And one of those things is generated through our panels. So if there are issues um, that the government are consulting on within the environment, we have a series of really deeply technical people who will respond to, to these legislative changes and things like that. So our panels cover those areas. Um, and they're, they're picked on people's skill set. We also have a series of networks, and these are open much wider. So it's an email newsletter database. So it's a way of keeping people up to date with issues within the environment. Again, interesting projects that companies are doing, whether they're private companies, uh, government organisations, or whether they're non-governmental organisations. So we, we do represent people both working in central government, local government, in private companies, and in the charity sector as well, um, both in the UK and overseas. Um, two things that are well worth looking at um, when you look at what we do is, is our groups. To actually join these groups, you have to be a member. There's lots of information using members and non-members, so do bear with me as we go through this. Rivers and coastal, so anything to do with flooding, river restoration, coastal erosion risk management, anything in those areas is covered by rivers and coastal group. Um, they will organise conferences and events and publish papers, um, technical papers, both within our journals and wider than that. Um, our urban drainage group deals with issues of modelling, so flood modelling, network modelling, um, any form of almost background research for putting solutions in place uh, around water issues generally. So if you, if you look up the terms of any urban drainage systems and suds, you'll find that our urban drainage group is something there and that's something that the government is pushing or house builders and planning authorities to look at as well. So that's a broad overview of all of the different groups and networks we have to give some idea of where this, we are the home for um, environmental professionals to sit. Paul mentioned that we have a royal charter. Our professional publication is C.Web, Chartered Water and Environment Manager. But this is where it gets even more confusing. We also have a license from the Engineering Council. So if you've ever heard of a chartered engineer, so someone that builds the roads or the skyscrapers you see in cities, we can also award chartered engineer to people working within the environmental sector. We also have a licence from the Science Council, so we can award chartered scientists. We also have a licence from the Society for the Environment to award chartered environmentalists. So one of the, the quite unique things we can do is we can award people for chartered titles. You know, an accountant can be chartered accountant. If you work in the environment, C.M., C.M., C.I.C.M. Um, so that's a, another thing that we think is quite unique. Um, professional qualification benefits. Um, it's letters after your name. I'm sure you've all seen people with business cards where they'll have name and then a job title, and quite often they'll have BSc, MSc, MBA. But if you see C.WEM, CA, CENG, um, all of the different other letters you can get, they're related to professional qualifications. What we say a professional qualification is, is a current qualification. Um, once you get a professional qualification, you're required to keep it up to date. So if you say, I am an engineer that delivers flood defence, and you've got C.WEM and CENG, the person employing you or the public when they see you speaking on a flooding issue will expect you to know what the most recent legislation is, uh, what the changes um, surrounding flooding within the UK and why to ensure that you're putting the best solutions in place. So you're required to do something called continuing professional development um, and that's assessed as part of um, our Royal Charter to make sure people are up to date. So that's why we say it's a, um, a current qualification. Anyone who achieves a professional qualification is assessed by members within the organisation at the appropriate level 
that they provide for you. So if you've got a chartered member, you're assessed by people doing similar work to you, you've already become a chartered member, a CEO one. Um, and it, it does help. We see lots of jobs now within our sector saying we want to charter people. We want people with professional qualifications, people that we know are at that level, so that when they come to interview, there's that implied level of competence and ability um, when, when they go for that job. <coughs> We have a very active policy department. So using those technical panels, networks, groups, we respond to government. We also put out briefing reports. Um, each of the documents on the right hand side are available on the website. Um, there's one for regulation of the water industry, surface water management, natural system services. Um, and they're, they're kind of industry leading on particular topics. So these will be referenced by people within the industry who often aren't members. So how do we get those members in if they're using the information that we're, we're, we're supplying? Um, we also do policy position statements. Um, it's, it's interesting, there's, there's not many bottles. Quite often I see people with bottled water. Um, on our website there's free access information for people in the industry. We've actually been one on bottled water. Um, I'm a non-environmental professional by trade. Um, I work on the administrative side. And one of the things I found very interesting reading policy position statements is if you buy a bottle of water, it's less regulated, as in what's contained in that bottle of water is less regulated than what comes out of the tap. So the tap water you have, there's more legislation surrounding what you drink in the bottle of water. Um, so there's lots of interesting uh, facts and tidbits under those policy position statements covering a whole range of different issues that would probably affect you in a day-to-day -day life that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Um, so that's where the public benefit comes in, saying, so here's an issue, this is what our professionals think we should be doing about it. Um, we're also actively involved, and I can go back to the government consultation. For the last election um, in the UK, we wrote a manifesto, which picked up six key areas that we thought the government should put forward in their policy for moving over the next governmental term, specific to the environment um, as well. Um, so that's something that we've, we've actually quite actively promoted, and it'll be interesting to see how that's been taken on by the coalition government to see if they actually hit any of those targets um, that we set out. And we also have an annual report, so if you want to get a broader view of everything that we do, the numbers of members, um, the financial makeup, there is an annual report that can be downloaded from our website as well. And it also talks about some of um, the key performance indicators from our corporate plan, which is our five year plan, which is where your assignment stems from, which is this 1% growth. Um, I think um, Howard's question about the 1% increase is, is quite interesting. What we see within professional bodies is the numbers of members is slowly declining. Um, and that's generally across the board, particularly at the charter level. So when we talk about a 1% increase of 10,000 being 450 to 500 members, that's because people at the end of their careers are leaving the institution, which is why we're a bit top heavy in the members and the more senior age ranges within the organisation. So what we need to do is if we're losing you know, 350 up to 400 members a year, how do we then get the 1% increase, which is why we get 450 to 500 new members a year. Because to pay, be a member, you pay an annual subscription. So in January, you get an invoice, you pay it, you're a member till the end of December. Um, so that's where the 1% increase comes from. Um, one of the interesting things as well is there was a, a, a big planning consultation, and our chief executive was quoted in the Daily Telegraph, the front page, and then was brought forward for a government panel as part of the consultation for all of the house building and planning regulations that um, were under review they were implemented last year. We also publish technical journals, Water and Environment, Journal of Public Management, and we also produce a magazine. Um, magazines top with the debate on environmental issues. It also has a broadsheet contained within it called Business Briefings, which is projects in the environmental sector, so it might be super sewers or it might be the latest in energy efficient windows, something that is a new technology, something that's different within the environmental sector. The Wedge Journal, Water Environment Journal and Web Magazine are given to members in all corporate grades of membership. So people who are members receive our magazine and journal. We also have a journal for risk management which is done separately for people to subscribe to. Um, we've got a presence in LinkedIn which I think is about 4,500 members. Um, we have two Twitter accounts which we say keep people up to date with what's going on within the environment, so following different RSS feeds, and producing the most recent policy activities um, of the government and, and other organisations. We also have a Facebook group. Um, something that we found quite unique within professional bodies is 
the people that do most of the work locally are members as volunteers. And our Facebook group was actually an example of where one of our local branches, so we have 14 across the UK, um, depending on geographical region, they realised that a lot of people were interacting through Facebook. And instead of the head office staff um, setting something up, they actually set up the Facebook group. Um, so if you're on Facebook or LinkedIn, it's worth having a look at those groups as well um, to see what we do on them, what we could do better, how we could utilise them um, in anything that we do. Um, and we also deliver training and conferences. So we're one of the few institutions that delivers purely online training. Um, the reason for that was we found that lots of companies wouldn't release people for a day out of the office to do a day's training because they lost the day's uh, productivity. So we took the opportunity to set up online units which are delivered purely um, in-house as well. They're open to everyone, not just members as well, and the costs are exactly the same for members and um, So that's a whistle-stop tour, and there's lots of information, which will be lots of blank faces and lots of questions, but that's where we are as an organisation. Um, so I look forward to anything you want to ask us. Before we open the questions, can I just ask a couple of uh, questions about the technical sort of things? One, is it possible that you can send me a copy of those slides? Yes. And then I'll load them onto uh, <coughs> you know, the uh, site. And the second uh, thing is a similar issue. I don't know if any of you have tried to get onto the uh, website, uh, but a lot of things that I was looking for that may well be of interest would be through what's only available to members. Is there any way we could open that up and have a, everything, an access of some way. Due, due to our status, everything that we give to members is available on our website. The only thing that is right. sat behind the part username password is a, a way to record someone's CPD. So right. we're going to fill in and okay. you don't want to pay so, our so, subscription to present. So, uh, so, 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 so we've got access yeah. to, to all of that. Okay. If, uh, okay. if I would, maybe if I just add, one, one of the things we're trying to get to is a lot, a lot of what we do, other professional bodies do, and the professional bodies in the engineering sector, science, the environment sector, there's a lot of bodies out there, so what makes us different is, is an interesting question that, that, that we're trying to grapple with. Our selling point can be the fact that we, we are there for anybody that works in the environment sector, but by the very nature of us being such a broad church, we have people that say, you don't do enough water, you don't do enough contaminated land, or you do too much water, you, do, you focus too much on waste. And, and so it's, it's, it's trying to find what we can do to sort of package that up, um, to make us seem different. We, we've got LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook, as Tom said, but to be honest, I don't think we use them properly, um, although there's a question mark. Maybe they're not the most effective things to use anyway. Maybe we don't differentiate them enough between different groups. So we're just trying to find some answers to these questions that we've been grappling with. Um, well, certainly Ron and I, when we looked at it, we are talking about it this morning, I both have the same, what exactly is it that you're offering? There's yeah, a huge it's website, and um, if I were in the industry, one of the things I'd be thinking is, well, why should I join? What is, what is I've written that one of my questions, but somebody else is going to ask me. <coughs> What's the U what is the US I have no idea from the site. And I've been trying to find it. <laughs> so, anyway, perhaps we can open it up to I saw one or two hands go up immediately. So, uh, so. You talked about um, a professional audience. Who would you say is like the main competitors? Um, competitors. Well because I know like some people chatters and like say there's quite a few. In terms of equivalent bodies, um, we, we, we share members with institutions such as the Institution of Civil Engineers, the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, the Institution of Chemical Engineers, who are general engineering bodies. So people tend to join us because they work in the water industry or the environment industry and they get access to scientists and environmentalists rather than the close thinking of sometimes groups of engineers together to work on those projects. In terms of environmental um, professional bodies. Um, we 
have uh, challenges against bodies such as IEMA, the Institution of Environmental Management and Assessment, um, Charles Institution of Waste Management, which is CIWM, um, the IES, which is the Institution of Environmental Sciences, the Institution of Environmental uh, Ecology and Environmental Management, which is IEEM. Uh, one of the confusing things we've also discovered recently is the Charles Institution of Waste Management also calls itself SIWA. We call ourselves SIWA. Um, so th 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 they would be a starting point. Another way of looking at that question is to look under the Engineering Council's website, um, where there are 38 bodies that can award Chartered Engineering, Corporate Engineering, Engineering Technician. The Science Council, which I think is about 18, is it? 18 to 20. Um, uh, the Engineering Council's website, which is www.ngc.org.uk. So, ENGC.org.uk. Um, the Science Council, which I think is just Science Council for all, um, but if you Google it, you should come up with that. Um, and finally, the Society for the Environment, where there's 23 bodies that can award Chartered Environmentalist. So, all of the ones that can award Chartered Environmentalist would have elements of what we do within their office members, um, all the work that their members do, and that's SOC everything all. Um, so S O C E M B dot all. Um, there's links from all those bodies to our web from our website. So if you can find them on our website, that's probably um, a good first <laughs> test. Um, judging by how it's experienced. Could I ask people when they're asking questions to speak up loudly because the air conditioning can't switch off. Is a bit loud, so uh, what is the price of the annual subscription at the moment? Uh, depends on the grade of membership and the external registrations. I can put up a web page for you to have a look at. Um, <coughs> I mean, why is the anomaly in those prices as well? Oh, well, bro broadly, if you, for example, we were, we've got a 10 inch membership. No, I'm not bothered about that. Like everybody has to. It's based, if, you're, it's, if it's you're chartered, the, you have to go through the full. Assessment where you look at your competencies, no, produce reports, do an specific question. You'll see it when it comes up. Uh, hopefully, on your subscriptions, you can pay by direct, direct, direct debit. debit. Yeah. Yeah. Ask them. And why is the members rate, which presumably is a big group, why is that one a pound more than every other grade? Everybody else gets charged five pounds extra. The members get charged six pounds <coughs> according to your website. If I'm looking at pricing as part of my strategy, that would be uh, something that might put me off. <laughs> what has been changed in the last week since I went on? So it would definitely get yeah, an extra pound from all the others. Just a typo over. So they're the annual subscriptions. Um, we also have two business level memberships as well, which are detailed below. Um, business affiliates and international partner organisations, um, which are the, the, the two at the low the individual membership. Um, and then one of the other challenges we faced is that a lot of people will retire um, and they are then entitled to a retired subscription as well. Um, because they're, they're, they're not earning. The, the subscriptions phase, as you go through it, there's also fees for applications and interviews as well. Um, so have a good look at that, um, and if that's something you want to comment on, feel free. It's worth looking at other bodies and not just looking at ours in isolation when you see the figures on that um, So I don't know if you just look at one body. So that's all. The reason for the direct debit and the credit card is the sense it's And why those were I don't know, but that's should be. It was right at the beginning of the year, so it's probably if you change it. What are the main benefits for them to become members? 
Sorry. What are the benefits for them to become members? The main benefits. benefits. Uh, it, it, it varies. I mean, the, the, the key thing is peer recognition. Every time we do a member survey, they say, I joined Simon because I want to get that recognition in the industry. Mm -hmm. And a lot of organisations, be they in the public and private sector, do look to see somebody as a professional qualification. Um, particularly, and, and if you're doing a lot of engineering jobs, you tend to have to be chartered as an engineer to sign up on those jobs. A lot of the people involved in flood risk management now have to have some form of professional qualification. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of the, the driver. Then it becomes things like access to information, access to the journals, the people you you start talking to at the meetings. <coughs> one, of, one of the things that, that, that we do is if you turn up to a meeting in an engineering body, you might be in a room talking to 40 civil engineers. But if you turn up to a meeting in Simon, you're going to be talking to people that are right across the range. And so that gives you different ways of thinking. People start to challenge you and ask different questions. So you get a lot of benefit from that side of things. Tom's mentioned the groups, uh, groups such as Rivers and Coastal and Urban Drainage are doing a lot of fascinating work which the members get access to. In fact, next month we're just about to release a, uh, an interesting report on urban pollution management. And some of the work in there will actually form the standards that will be adopted by DEFRA. So you start to get access to uh, government, start to influence thinking. And of course, as an organisation, we we're promoting increasingly networks and knowledge transfer. Um, don't ask us how we're doing that or what that really means, because that's, that, that, that's another challenge. But Tom's shown you the online units, and one of the things we, we aim for with those units is to look at what, what people have learned. So it's not just here's the information, what have you, how have you used it, what have you learned, what have you done with it? And that's, a, that's quite a big advantage. And as our groups, um, as our members across the world, we're trying to mix of that knowledge transfer. So people in New Zealand can talk to people in the UK or people in Canada and start to share knowledge on different issues. I think that's a really good point. One of the interesting things is uh, the, the two groups run conferences um, and I actually attended one of the conferences last year and one of the criticisms would be we'd be very UK focused, not, not even looking out to Europe with, with them. And they actually had someone, it was a disembodied voice with a PowerPoint presentation and we were sat in Birmingham and they were sat in Brisbane. Australia, um, and it was through um, some form of uh, go to meeting or whatever it was, they were able to give a presentation and respond to questions um, thousands of miles away, and that was really well received. Um, and it's also ways of challenging established standards that are used in the UK when we talk about flooding. We also looked at the Brisbane presentation, was on the Queensland flooding in Australia, which had different issues but did the same principles apply. And there was another presentation that was from um, New Orleans was talked about Hurricane Katrina uh, and flooding there, and it was really interesting to see the different views. Um, on that, one of the benefits of professional qualification is also that lots of um, organisations will tend to send their chartered people on overseas projects. They will also tend to give them a, a salary increase or increase staff within organisations as well. So, though it's not guaranteed, is the potential for, for higher earnings is one of the big selling points of professional qualification. Um, and that, as I said, is reflected through the jobs markets on our website, where if you look, a lot of them will say chartered person or person working towards a charter status, um, which is why you join as a, a non-chartered member, either a graduate or a, or a member. You mentioned a few minutes ago um, about having done some surveys. Um, could we have any access to any of those surveys? Only as a total, but to see why people, or what people are saying, they join yeah. for and things like that. It, it, it seems a waste of time having the students here trying to repeat those things uh, if that sort of information is already available. We can share what we have today. The, the current survey ends on the 20th of next month. Right. So we've done it through survey monthly, so yeah. we can share the information we have today. If, if that's uh, a <coughs> you will all be that, obviously.
the insights already as to why membership um, is at the higher end of the age range. You would have expected lots of younger people to want to join the organisation. Are there any barriers you've found uh, out to stopping people from joining? There's probably two, two issues. <coughs> if I start with Tom, can talk about this for his experience. One, if you look at the origins of the institution, um, it goes back to 1890s when with the origins of Simon the public health engineers are starting to look at wastewater, starting to recognise that wastewater was causing problems in terms of health. <coughs> and as a result, that history has meant that it's, it's grown up through the water sector and others and people have joined and have been told to join. And so we've had lots of long-standing members. And like every professional body that you speak to, every professional body's got an aging membership. And I think part of the reason, and I don't, I don't want to bias what, what you all think, but from my own perspective, part of the reason is if you look at a professional body, generally I think people believe and think they're in the last century and not the 21st century. And that's a challenge for professional institutions, even those in the environment sector, which is far, far more popular now. If you look at the younger end, where we do have an increasing interest in cyber, the fascinating thing for me is that of our recent membership, there's a 50 50 split between men and women. Not reflected in the higher end, but it's definitely reflected in the lower end, the age range 25 to 35. And we are way ahead of professional bodies in that respect, particularly engineering ones. How we then utilize that and capture it is another question because people nowadays don't have the same pressure to be a member of a professional body. So they start to say, why am I a member, rather than they've been told to be a member, uh, or it's been a, a professional requirement. It is with accountancy and with being a doctor and things like this, but it, across a lot of professions these days, there isn't that requirement is that used to be in the past. Um, so we have to sell ourselves. One of the interesting things on that is everyone from this tab which is going through. Sorry, um, one of the interesting things is that uh, Paul picked up on medical professionals. Not everyone in this room will see a doctor in a year, but everyone will drink all the chance of the time. And lots of our members produce drinking water through their rooms. Um, yet you don't actually have to have a professional qualification necessarily to work for water. So just as two, two different <coughs> industries with two different ways of regulating. Uh, I think something as well um, on that point as well. The Society for the Environment registers chartered environmentalists. So someone becomes chartered environmentalist through our established Society for the Environment. And we currently hold the most chartered environmentalists. Um, and that's in the last 10 years that has become available. Um, and what we're doing is we're registering new members as chartered environmentalists rather than existing members upgrading to chartered environmentalists. So in, in one way it's going down, but in another way we're actually leaving edge in one of the licenses that we hold. So it feels like it's kind of uh, we were, yeah, yeah. In, in, in some ways, it's, 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 it, it, I think it's checking time. Could they hold just a uh, chartered engineer status through you and not be chartered in yours? Or would they have to be chartered, chartered in they could, they could transfer it to us if they could be chartered with another organisation or trans and, and they transfer it join, to us. Yeah, no, I meant that if they come in as your members, they've got to have your chartered status before they can chartered you. Yeah, to, to, to be a chartered engineer with us, we have to be a chartered chartered by us as chartered status. Um, I, I've got two questions. The one is you mentioned like there were a presentation in Australia and the other one uh, was about New Orleans, for example. The people who actually prepare and do all this work, are they just volunteers or are they, um, do they get paid or just interesting how it's working? Like when a conference or whatever is set up, how get those people in invited and, and actually get started, like asked to do it? There's, there's, there's two models for conferences. Sometimes a keynote speaker will be invited. So it'll be a name that is a headline name of people in that industry who know this person who wants to listen to them. And they'll give a keynote address. Most of the other presentations are done through an academic model where you invite people who 
have done project prepared papers to submit them and there'll be a committee that selects the most relevant ones for the overarching title of what the company's trying to deliver. Yep. So they wouldn't be paid um, and what they would want to do is share their experiences from a project or from a piece of research that they've done. The, the organisation administration is, is, is volunteers, it's done it's by the members. And one of the things we try to emphasise is we're, we're not just an environmental professional body, we're a registered charity. So we talk to members about when they do these things on a voluntary basis, they're not just fulfilling their role as a professional person, they're actually doing something on a charitable basis as well, which if it provides information on the environment, is also having a service that's like a public good. It's just interesting to know because then you actually face the same challenge like every club. Like, like for example, I'm in a host club and I know volunteer work is hard to find, so just to make it on the level. And the other question I've got is, uh, in your mission, you say you only, or you, you say it, it's for five years to, to, to render, uh, no, to survive for the next five years. Why is it only five years? Our, our, our corporate plan is, is targets for a five-year period. At the end of that five-year period, we get another corporate plan. So this is, the element that we've picked up is that they're like our fundamental <coughs> indicators. Um, so the KPIs are defined over a five year period, we want to track the progress we're making, the developments um, that we've achieved over that period. Um, and the one that has been a challenge, the corporate plan was in 2011. So we are, haven't actually hit that 1% net, so take into account new and resigning members of that 1% growth. Um, so that's that's why this project is particularly timely because if we go back, that's actually quite a big increase. We need those final three years of the corporate plan um, because the next corporate plan could have a different target, um, and that's set by our trustees. So members of our institution act like our board of directors, um, and they, with the executive management staff, so with the paid employees, the volunteers, who are the trustee board, help to, to to set out what our KPIs are. So we want to be around for many more years. A number of different ways. Um, we have our local branches. Um, we also have champions within companies. Um, we have also go out and give presentations. Our magazines and the journals are, are more widely read, um, but it's not very uh, directed. It, it, it can be quite a scattergun approach, I think, depending upon where there's an opportunity within a company, we'll go to that company, it's quite reactive. What sort of companies that you go to? Do you see something in all single companies? Um, <coughs> I, 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 a lot of them. Um, in some will have multiple members, you know, 10s, 20s, maybe up to 50. Um, then people at the Environment Agency, we've probably got to 1,000 or so members. Um, but then we have lots in consultancy, so environmental engineering um, consultancies, um, a few members in DEFRA. And then lots of people do, within the environment, are actually kind of sole traders, individual consultants working within the environment. So there really is a, a broad range. We also have people who work with, uh, Charities like WaterAid, who do overseas development and things like that. But whether we, we use the, con the conferences as well. The conferences, because of our charter, are open to anyone who's got an interest in the subject. So we use the conferences to talk to the non members uh, about the value of being a member of the organisation. So, Vincent, you were the trial event to sound on the I mean, if, with organisations like Balfour's, we, what we try and do is say, there's enough of a, of a group, we look at the idea of a structured training scheme, and the people that get involved in the scheme, which might run anywhere from two to four years at the end of it, will have the experience 
that's relevant and that each of the com competencies that, that we define that equals chartership. And then there's four, 14 of those. So by the time they've done that training, they've got the experience across all of those different areas. Um, but it, it's not in every organisation. Yeah. I have a question actually. Uh, to stick with the both uh, objectives, we have not just one objective to raise 1% of uh, uh, number of uh, members, okay, a year. It's to retain the same number that you currently have, right? Yeah, it's yeah. Right, yeah. <coughs> for retaining, for retaining the same number of employee of uh, members, okay, is there a feedback from your memberships? about the uh, services uh, that, you, that you offer for them. Uh, for example, like Sierra, customer relationship with you that you can get feedback about the customer to, to make customer retention at the end of the day, okay? And the uh, second question about gaining new members to the company, is there a linkage between the activities of the company that you are currently doing these days, okay, to your members, like conference and events that you speak, that, that you previously said, and um, annual dinner, I, uh, I got this idea from the, the website, okay. Is there a linkage between that after this conference, conference or event um, has been conducted by your company, okay, is there, is there a mechanism applied to know that I get a new members from this activity and they get a new num number from another activity just to make this analysis to put our efforts okay and focus on the same track okay and enhance this activity okay to gain more members maybe just one conference or one event a year is not enough from my point of view the the, la the third question is is there a study has been applied or accomplished by the company about the, uh, the competitor's analysis about the key factors of their success? You said that so many competitors these days of the company. Is there, is there the study has, has, has been up accomplished and done by the company? This is the third. The last question is uh, the uh, history uh, analysis of company performance that year, I mean year over year, year after year, I get uh, in 2011 125 new members. Okay, what was my marketing strategy in this year that I got this number? Is there analysis of these, thing, these things? Because we need to know the standing status of your company okay, to be able to know how could I go through the right track and being moving in the right direction. That's all. <laughs> yeah, um, the, uh, well, the answer to the first question is there's a lot of information coming through now. Um, we're, as I said, we're, we're doing the member surveys so we can answer quite a bit of the customer relations side of things. Um, and we're aiming to get 15% response rate. And we're not too far from there, we've, we've hit the 1,000 mark this, this week. So that's why that's one challenge, because then we'll have a significant amount of data to, to, to work with. Where we're weaker is we, we do get feedback from our conferences and events, and we're trying now to build in feedback from people who actually come to be interviewed by the organisation. So we're trying to capture as much data as we actually can. Um, in terms of the classic SWOT analysis, we can probably indicate why the organisations are more successful in certain areas than others. There's not been a detailed analysis, but we meet these organisations on a regular basis. So Tom mentioned the uh, Charter Institute of Waste Management. Um, there are specific regulations that relate to waste management. There's an organisation called WAMITAB, which defines the training that has to be done. And that training is licensed to CIWF. So a big part of their budget is training. They've got the license for that. Now, can we look at that sort of an option? Is a big question mark. Um, I don't, I don't know. Is a simple answer. Um, in terms of what events have been su su successful and why, that's a more interesting question. I couldn't give you now data that says 
the people that attend our surface water management conference, we always get 10% that have joined. Um, we're looking at taking a more active approach in those events, in talking to the people who are not the, not the members. But I couldn't tell you right now if there's a, there is no metric that says doing that equals this. Um, so that, that's a challenge for us going, going forward as an organisation. Um, now we have our corporate plans in place. So as an institution, we've gone from the status where we were governed by a council. The council was up to 46 people. And I sat in more broadly enough of those meetings that were dreadful and lasted for a whole day. We're now governed by a trustee board of 12 people. And they really are beginning to operate at the board. So there's, there's much more focus on what we do going forward, why we do it, what's beneficial, what isn't beneficial. And this is a this is what's beginning to evolve there. But we don't have that data going back a few years or, or, or that understanding. I think in the conferences as well, we don't just run national conferences, we have these 14 local branches with each of them running from 10 to 20 conferences and events a year as well. Um, so one of the mechanisms that we're looking to put in place is to see which events that are run locally are successful, that get members and members, and then can we do that on a larger scale, and then how we turn those, if you get 20% of non-members at a local branch, then how we get a national event, how we transfer that into to, to actual paid members um, as well. So it's worth looking at those. Um, one um, on your, your, your final point about looking at other institutions, there's an organisation called PAR, which is the Professional Associations Research Network. Um, and we're part of PAR, so our members do respond to their um, surveys and their research. And they've done some quite interesting surveys. And I think they're available on the PAR website, which I don't off the top of my head, about member engagement. Um, recruitment, retention, and all of those different issues. So if you had a look at that, if you wanted to... Can you to, repeat it one more time? It's PARN, yeah. it's P-A-R-N. It's, it's the Professional Association of this Research Network. Um, we've got access to that data, if it's all secure and if it's very good, should we? So <laughs> on, on the same sort of thing, am I right then in thinking that you wouldn't if you have somebody leave your membership or take them to say it's quite great? We can go back to them and say why is it we, we, we do, do. We do. Yeah, we so do. do you have that on an annual basis? Uh, yeah. there's, there's a, so many left because they're retiring, so many left yes. because because those are often useful things to, to buy. Do you actually have the retention policy in place that drops out to actually do actively do something to find that private private Yeah, they they they, they get a if, if they resign. It, it, it's more challenging because there, there are different ways people drop out of membership. Um, people don't pay their subscriptions, so they just will go suspended, so that's a lost member. But people who resign um, with the resignation letter, they also get sent to serve. With suspended members, we do email them to say, because some of them just don't realise they haven't paid, um, which is a really easy way of getting someone back. Um, they say, oh yeah, I've got to pay, I'll, I'll, I'll come and pay. But you also get people who, we want to know, have you left the sector? because not everyone will work in the water environment industry for their entire career. Um, so we do go to them. The, the response rate from suspended members is not anywhere near as high as it is for the resignations, because the resignations have made a conscious effort to tell us that even, and quite often in their letter will say why. Do you, um, I mean, obviously you're going to want to capture graduates. For students on accredited courses, we offer them free membership whilst they're studying. Um, and on graduation, paying student fee, they can then transfer to a higher grade. And because most of our accredited courses are at MSC level, it's not just transferring to graduate, we do see people transfer from student directly to chartered member um, as well. So, so there, there are incentives there. We've also recently, just to give an explanation of how someone, what someone will pay when they become a member, um, we have six meetings a year to welcome people into membership. That's when the assessments take place. Um, after those meetings, generally, people who are completely new to the organisation also pay a prorated subscription of the annual subscription. So if you join in March, you pay nine months. If you join in September, you pay three months. If someone joins as a graduate, the fee they pay to join can't 
covers them for the rest of that year. So they do get an incentive in that it costs them less than if they were going to be a membership. Is that clear on your website that you can get it pro rata? I didn't know this, you know, it, the membership applies for the whole website year. Website's a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mess. I don't think this is going to be valuable or not, but there's a complete section on FAQs where you know, try to answer a lot of these sorts yeah. of questions. Yeah, well. but do you always go to those? Uh, you know, I was looking at some two different roads at one point. You particularly notice that. Mm -hmm. Many graduates are going to graduate in the middle of the year, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's quite relevant to them um, at that particular point. And they may have forgotten about it when they've already got a job in January and stuff. No, I don't need the answer. Those sort of things might be suggested. Anything yeah. like that? Yeah. Because we, one of the challenges we've had, and we probably should have said this at the outset, is. We're experts in what the organisation does, but don't necessarily understand how it appears looking from outside in. Um, when we give a presentation, someone will ask us, what do you do? We could talk for three hours of what we do, and you just see the faces switch off, because we've not necessarily hit the, the, the target market, which is why any feedback you can give us on those issues would be great. Um, do you have any um, examples of previous marketing strategies? Like how you try to raise the awareness or? Quite, quite embarrassing, no. <laughs> uh, we, to give you some idea of the organisational structure, is we don't, marketing sits within lots of different individuals' roles. So what we're looking for is, if you look at SciWeb, and, and how we want to both allude with this, you look at the website, you don't really know what you do. And I think that's a reflection of it. Everything that goes onto the website is not done by one central person, it's done by different segments of the organisation within the head office staff. Have you got any organisational structure to access? Um, yes, yeah, we, you we can we'll give you the relevant links through, through, through the website so you can see the structure, how it's set up. Okay. Okay. There's a one, of, one of the challenges we definitely have is that, I mean, I think you've alluded to it today, is, is, is the way we communicate. There's a lot of information there but it's how that's co communicated. One of the things we didn't mention is we, we run an environment photography competition, and it's grown year on year, and, it's, and it gets coverage in lots of the press, and the national news, newspapers, even national ge 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 geographic. The only, the only newspaper that got our name right and referenced us in relation to that competition was The Sun. Believe it or not, the Guardian got it wrong, the Telegraph did. So we've got to get it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but if, if the newspapers are not, yeah, the New York Times got it right. Um, but if these national national communication tools are not referencing our organisation, there's a great thing that we do, and nobody knows it next to us. So there's there's a challenge there, and we're not we're not really sure how we address that. Could I just ask a related question around that? It was a little bit of an idea of the resources we've got and bringing the organisation to the other organisations. We're 20 staff and it's a third split broadly between the yeah. membership team where we're being toxic and then the international team, um, the accountancy, admin team and the people that do the policy. How many staff do you say? 20. 20, 20 altogether for all the branches. 20, we have a head office staff at headquarters, and, and that's all that's yeah. If you take out the chief executive of the eight, there's 18 staff, and it's roughly six per department in the three departments, which are membership, finance, administration, policy, and conferences. Well, you've had your hand up, yeah. 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 Um, <coughs> It's interesting, we do see them come back through the year yeah. um, when they realise they haven't paid. Um, and sometimes it, it's, it's <coughs> just a mistake, they assume they have a direct debit because they notice the five pound reduction in fees. Yeah. So, it, it, but it's definitely the non paying is the biggest problem. Do you know of the number of people having come back after? It's. 
That's a good question, not off the top of my head. I mean, to, to give you some idea of how our structures work at subscription time, subscriptions are due on the 1st of January. Yeah. Um, we send out the invoices in the first week of October now, um, because we, we understand it costs a lot of money over Christmas for some of their subscription time. Direct debits are taken on the first week of December and January, so it's not a monthly direct debit, it's two payments um, split in December and January. At the end of January, um, we add an administrative charge for a late fee, um, and then the suspension run happens at the end of March. But in between um, the invoices going out and the suspension run, we send out reminder emails with interesting bits of work we're doing as well. So, you know, have you paid your subscription? Here are our plans for next year. And have you done the Part of it is for services, part of it is for charitable aims, um, and part of it is for yeah, to, to, um, distributing information to the public benefit, responding to consultation with government, um, actively trying to promote the environmental case, it's, environmental awareness. It's, it's the aims and objectives in our royal charter. We, we have a royal charter, but we're also regulated by the charities. So we have to demonstrate our ch charitable aims and our aims and objectives every year. We have to demonstrate that we are meeting those as an organisation. And if you're interested in that, that's where the annual report is not just here's the finances, it's this is what we've done for public benefit for membership services, <coughs> conferences and events for responding to consultation. So the annual report, which is available to download, and the, the most recent one will be 2011, uh, because the 2012 one will be published around. Sorry, you can't Me. Uh, yeah. 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 Do you know um, you mentioned some of the other environmental agencies? Do you know what your numbers are compared to theirs? And um, you don't think you guys are trying to bite off more than you can chew by, you know, doing everything that's under environmental agency rather than just focusing on what I think, you know, from hearing you guys today, you guys seem to your bread and butter seems to be water around based around water management. Our, 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 I mean, we're, we're broadly similar to organisations like IEMA in terms of numbers. Yep. We're higher numbers than the, the Waste Management Institute and the, the, the um, Institute of um, Environmental Scientists, etc. So we're, we're sort of, in terms of the environmental bodies, we're number one or two. In terms of biting off more than we can chew, it's, it's that's something that's vexing a lot of our membership at the moment because. Yep. Um, you're right to a degree that our history is water, our, our history goes back to sanitation. Yeah. But as, as these sectors have developed, you, know, you just look at climate change, the face of climate change is water. But as a result, people are dealing with everything now. It's not just flood risk management, it's resilience and building with infrastructure, it links into energy management, it links into green roofs and green infrastructure, and yeah. water for an ecosystem. And so we're actually being pushed and challenged and pulled into different, lots of different Areas. Yeah, and that reflects our uh, members. Yeah. But very few of our members work only on water now. They're, they're subject areas. I mean, some may do in water companies, but many are working right across a whole range of yeah. environmental issues. It sounds like you guys have got the skills, like in your members. But do you think you guys have the skills in your staff? Like you mentioned, you've got 20 staff. Would you would you say that you know, you've got the skills to take this institute forward where you guys want to go? The staff has definitely, has definitely got the skill base to, to do it. Yeah. Whether we've got the numbers, that, that would be a more interesting question. I mean, when the Charities Commission looks at how many staff you have to members, and we're always we're always like number one. Yeah. But whether that means, as a, as a result, we have too few staff per hundred members, that's a question that um, we look at other professional bodies. You don't always say we have too too few. You're getting more? I don't know. Um, we're, we're in a change That's because in a year, year and a half's time, we're, we're about to move into a new building, which is going to change the structure and, and help with the finances of the way we can operate. And then the answer to that would be yes. Quite much more time.
It's, it's an indication of the relevance of what, what we do and what our members do. I think in terms of, I think you're right. Um, it, in terms of the marketing strategy, I think it, it has been very, very difficult to go out um, and do things. And I think it goes back to your colleague in front's question about the number of staff. Um, within our organisation, we'll have a very strong administrative role, as well as a very strong promotion role. And quite often there's just not enough hours in the day to, 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 to do everything that you need to do um, to maintain a bottom line that allows us to build our new building to, to move in. So over the last, I think, it's probably four or five years since I've been at Cyber, the plan has been to move offices. And I think at the point the office move comes in, which is why, again, this is a very timely project and we're really pleased that you've taken the opportunity to take this on, is how can we do things in a more structured way? How can we establish what works? Because at the moment it's a, a toe in the water technique, and we think that works, so we'll go with that. And we'll hit one very small segment of what we do, ignoring the, 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 the maybe another equally uh, beneficial group to one side. So I think we are slowly putting more strategies in place. We've put together a recruitment and retention group. So you, you do have a recruiting group? Uh, yeah. we, we do. It's very new. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's, it was middle of last year we started. What, what are they doing? Um, well, I'm talking a lot of them. <laughs> it was the best way to describe it. Because they're members. Um, to, to give you a bit of background as well, we implement the strategy of the members. We try and uh, act like the shepherds um, to get them into an area that we think we can actually do something in here. But the problem is we have such diverse opinions of our members so putting that down into a consolidated strategy is very difficult. Um, I think there's been four meetings now, the recruitment and retention group, and we've only just gone from an ideas log to the early stages of an action plan. You say it's the members that have formed that group for that strategy? Yes, they, they, they formed that group. Yeah. Would you therefore say that you're more reactive than proactive? Precisely, so definitely in the role of and it comes back to the question we were challenged on earlier that we. We also need to lead on certain things, and it's difficult doing that if there's no more stuff. And if we give you a couple of initiatives that since I started we put in place, we used to accredit academic programmes, where we'd go in, day one, accredit a programme, five years later say, you do for re-accreditation. Um, when I came in, I said, I'd like to go and meet the new intake students every year, because that's a few thousand people that have probably used an accreditation as a reason for going there, so now we go and meet the new students, um, and that's a very low-level strategy that now we've got 15 universities, we try and go and visit them. But, but that, I mean, we do the same, uh, not necessarily at this level, but with our undergraduates. Um, we do the same with the Chartered Institute of Market. They can come in and see how undergraduate <laughs> take at year one, but because it's the same time, we have them come in and see year two, see year final years at the same time. What, what, what that has done, I mean, coming back to what you've raised earlier, is that, that that's been, we're, we're doing things that we have done, but we're also doing things that some other professional bodies do that, that work. So accreditation is a good example. And what's happened since, since Tom's joined the organisation is we've been asked to accredit courses in other parts of the world. So in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, we've been asked to go to QA. We've accredited courses in Hong Kong, and we've recently been asked to go to Chongqing in China to accredit courses as, as well. So that's going to lead to benefits for the organisation. Um, one or two other professional bodies take the strategy of focusing on the key companies in their sector. So if you look at the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, they focus on, on um, Rolls-Royce Rolls and the aerospace sectors and others. And, 
they, as a result, those organisations say we want people to be um, chartered engineers through the Institute of Mechanical Engineers right across our company. And our company's got offices all over the world. That's something we've not yet tried. I mean, but it's something we can start to look at as a result. Um, we, we are, <coughs> like the accredited students as well, um, one of the other things that we've done is we've been invited to go to India to, to sit with a company much under that principle saying look, we, we're a multinational company, we want to go and have a, a, a standard um, that all employees working at particular levels are assigned to professional bodies and we think for our environment towards people you're the right body so it's reactive but we're obviously doing something right to be going to that company and that led to another company, and it's actually been more successful with a company that didn't send us out there, who I just happened to arrange a meeting with, and networked with them. We've actually had, I think, about 30 or 40 members from a, one company within India, which if you look, if we could get 10 companies doing that, 20 companies doing that, we hit the four, five, the six. The problem with being reactive, though, uh, as I'm sure the students will learn to, to realize, is that you're just reacting to things you may well end up very unfocused and going down lots of different lines, which appears to me to yeah, be yeah. what's happened with the organisation. And lacking that focus means that you've got to use those few resources you have in a wide range of areas, and none of them are necessarily being satisfied. That might be one of the reasons why overall you're struggling to keep those numbers going. I'm not definitely saying, but it's a possibility. It's, it's a, it, it is a valid point. Would you, uh, this is a question, I suppose, for, for the lecturers and also for you guys. Um, would you be able to cost out what you think it would cost us as an organisation to implement some of your strategy and your ideas? You would expect, if I could just take part of that, I would expect from, uh, they'll have access if they haven't already, uh, to, to my recommendation of what should be in the strategy. One of the issues points down there is to look at budgetary issues. Yeah. They obviously are not in the industry and don't have access to all the numbers and so on. But I would expect them to have a stab at it and look at the costs of doing different things. Um, whether or not I've seen these reports over many years, whether or not they're all realistic is another question. But I would expect them to at least have a stab at what it would cost because they can't afford to do it. Is putting it into a strategy. Uh, I was just going to add, I mean, one, one indicator for the students, if you can download the, um, the company report, download the report from the website, that will give you an idea of what the turnover of the company is, and it will give you a sort of framework, if you like. If you come up with a plan that's going to cost £10 million, then chances are it's not a good idea. Uh, so it will at least give you some kind of range of what could be affordable, so as a guideline. And think about when you're looking at strategies, things like you just mentioned about networking. What are the costs of doing different things? A TV advertising company is going to cost millions. So, you know, is that a good idea to put in? Networking, using the contacts that you've got, you've got past members, future members, current members, and so on. Those sort of things can do a lot. But how do you actually use it? How do you structure it? How do you communicate? to know as well if there's if, is there a rule of thumb that says for particular organisations X percent of your turnover should be focused on marketing and communications? Well X, I don't I don't I don't have a figure because I'm not aware of a rule of thumb but maybe maybe there is one because it's not it's not the sector that I'm involved in but there, there must be something out there that says to really start to make yourself effective and potentially grow by so many percent per year, then so many percent of your turnover should be spent on marketing and communications. Well, if you 
recommend you going down that route? Would we recommend you look at the objectives that you've got, yeah. looking at the cost of those achievements of those, rather than what that percentage goes? Some companies do work on that basis, yeah. but just having a percentage. But <coughs> I'm likely to underperform or put too much money in the So it's not a good approach to actually use. But looking at the objectives, looking at what you need to achieve that, and then looking at Kenya. It's it's within the um, it's within our corporate plan and that this five year period and certainly will be for the next year absolutely. But to be honest, if you look across the sector as a whole, I think um, professional bodies are characterised by their variety. It's a nice way of putting it, and I think there needs to be con consolidation across not just the environment part, but across the engineering part as well. It, and it is, it, it is sitting there with the Board of Tri Trustees as, a, as an action to take forward. Do you work with a lot of the trade bodies as well, like the FDWI and things like that? Or? Yes, we do. We support some of their events as well as those with British Water and other <coughs> organisations. And, and we're looking at doing something on that. Um, um, with a group that's linked to the CRWM that's doing the big resource and waste management complex. <coughs> yes. Um, how do you compete against competitors and what do you think in your own opinion gives you a competitive advantage over others? It's, 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 it's interesting. What your colleague said was our maybe we're biting off more than we can chew. Quite often people say that's our greatest strength. That is the uniqueness that we hit environmentalists, engineers, scientists. Um, we, we, we cross the board. So you go into a meeting with us, and it goes back to networking. You don't just meet with the people that do exactly what you do. You meet the people who are telling you why you do it, and you meet the people who will actually do it as well. Um, so it's a double edged sword. In one hand, it's, that's great. In the other hand, you get that you're not doing enough on this, you're not doing enough on this, you're not doing enough. So do too much on that. Um, and I think in terms of the actual product is the four charter titles and I think that represents the breadth that if you've got someone working within the environment who is academically qualified and experientially qualified as an engineer, they can be a chartered engineer within the water and environment, you can be a scientist within the water environment, or you can be very clearly an environmentalist. But you mentioned uh, one of the aims is about looking at your brand. Surely that's diluting your brand, um, creating problems in terms of USB as to how people look at you. Um, I'd, I'd agree with the last part. I'd, I'd challenge the, the former part. I think it might, in a lot of ways, strengthen the brand. If you're just one sector these days, it doesn't seem to work. But most people who are not have a wholly corporate name, which is clearly identified. And then maybe some brands within that. Yeah, there's a there's a but there is you're a, looking yeah, at here yeah, each yeah. one almost equal, or it's come that's the way it's coming across. Yeah. So you don't recognise the core. I, I think uh, you've you, you hit the nail on the head, and I think that there there are two sides to this, and I think the same point is the breadth. Mm. But it's not something you can write down on paper. When we've actually had a recruitment attention meetings, they go around that point. They go, what is what should we say our USP is? because we're going to upset someone if we don't have it as this breath. So, and it, and it, and it changes, and, and two good examples in the past 18 months has been our group in Northern Ireland have used the reports we've done, the knowledge on water, to actually influence the regulations that are now, that are now being brought into the water sector in Northern Ireland. The sort of flip side of that is our members in Hong Kong have used the reports we've done on waste and waste management to influence the Hong Kong government <coughs> thinking on waste management issues. And because Hong Kong is driven by engineering, we were the only body to comment on waste management issues in Hong Kong. So we end up with one saying, what well, waste management is your brilliant thing, another one saying, water is your brilliant thing. And it's, it's, it's interesting that it goes into the strategy for other organisations that we do. Yeah. So, as we be, uh, frankly speaking, uh, 
do you think that the objective is re realistic? Okay. This project. Yeah, objective one person a year. It's ultimate objective for the company. From your point of view, do you think is it realistic? Well, I, I think it, it 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 is if we can if we can get a strategy that we can follow, we can, we can assess the key milestones along the way. And at present, I think we've illustrated to you that we've got this scattered on approach that someone said, can you do this? We go and do that, and it maybe dilutes what we are actually doing. Um, the one percent we did actually because determined, you know, one person means you know your capabilities and you set this target. You know your capabilities and you set this target. It's about after the one percent. Um, when we talk about charter members and professionally qualified members, we've actually increased the number of new charter members that have been interviewed and brought into membership in the last few years by about I think it's about fifty percent. We were interviewing about somewhere between 140 and 160. In the last two years, we've got that to 240. Um, so we have the capability to deal with the number of applications. And maybe that's where we've spent too much time creating capability to deal with this mythical 400 applications, maybe. Uh, but we've got the capability to do that. It's getting to the point where we've got them to process. Uh, yeah, because we've, we've spent a long time revising an application procedure looking at how interviews are done, looking at the cost of interviews, how can we do it more effectively, how can we actually... I think one of the, the things we've done that's, that's been really useful is we've got a lot of... For one new member, at a professionally qualified level, they're interviewed by three of our existing members. And what we've done is we've got about 50 or 60 of our interviewers together on a day after a day's interviews where we've maybe interviewed 60 people and got them talking. They've then gone back to their organisations and said, look, Sion is changing its application procedure. It's it's looking at the experience of the applicants and why they want to do it. And I think that's actually starting to filter through and why we've been able to achieve it. Thank so you. it's not we marketing. Do, we do have no, a, thank you, yeah. a, we're enhancing the role of the mentors as well, the mentors and sponsors for people new to the organisation. So there was a bottleneck where it could take you 18 to 24 months to go through the whole process. What we've now done is introduce a new system whereby it should not take you more than six months. If it does, then we're, we're failing. But as Tom said, that, that's been quite a strong focus for us for the past 15 months. And what, we, what we're trying to do now is to say, great, we've done this. What other things do we need to start to do to sort of get a different message out? To get to and to create that focus. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Present, the branches are autonomous from head office. So the local branches set their agenda, and it's often the chairperson. We have a president who is the president of the whole organisation, and they pick a theme for their presidential year. Um, so at the moment, it's health. Isn't it? it's public, public health. Public health. Public health. Yeah, public health. Um, that's then done at the branch level. So someone might choose communicating the environmental case and they'll run a series of events around issues in their area and how they communicate better with the industry, the public. Uh, for example, it might be a region that suffers bad flooding. How do we communicate with the public better on flooding? It might be a thing. So that's so difficult. Can I just have one um, conversation going on? Because it's been time for a while. But if you, if you look at the events that happen, I mean, in terms of the professional outputs from the events, the presentation material, that's pretty con con consistent in terms of quality. But what we're starting to do now is get hold of that presentation material and put it onto a website. And what we hope to do going forward is look at ways of streaming that. So if you can't get to Exeter or to Bradford or to Huddersfield, you can get onto the website and start to look at what's been said and break that further in the interaction. Um, on your website, you talk about. Um Powerful evidence-based lobbying. So what have you actually done? Can you give us an example of that and what kind of things you've influenced or the planning 
reforms. Um, in, in the slideshow, there was the daily telegraph at the time. The Roman Code Daily Telegraph, we were the company, and our chief executive was actually called because of the policy work that had done and the lobbying that had, that had, that had uh, developed from the evidence based report or position statement we put forward, we were actually called in front of the government's task force to talk around that issue. Mm. Um, we, we, we've done one recently on, on food waste as well, and, and <coughs> in the presentation um, Tom showed you was uh, uh, at the front cover of the, man the manifesto. What we've done with the manifesto is written to every MP and said, if you're getting involved in issues linked to any in, in, in environmental subject, we will offer a buddying system where one of our members will agree to act as a, a sort of knowledge base for you so you can up, up, upskill yourself on this and you can go to Parliament and ask more questions. Um, and I think we, we're at the stage where more than 200 MPs have taken that up. So it's not all MPs, but it's approaching a, 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 a third of them now. So um, what, what that will do is, a, is another question. You see, this is a way of adding value to any other way to add value to people driving of, of, of potential customers apart from that and peer recognition? Uh, well, we're, we're one of the few, possibly the only organisation, but I'd, I'd hesitate to say that, that takes some of that policy work and professional development work and does it in Europe. We link into a couple of professional bodies around the water and the sector. And it's led to institution members becoming involved <coughs> in some of the strategic groups under things like the Water Framework Directive, under some of the climate change um, um, pr proposals being developed by the European Commission. Now, whether that's considered added value or not is another question, but it's starting to get the voice of the professionals heard at the leg legislative level. Now, from a personal viewpoint, I think that's really important because when you see the lobbying bodies, they've got a very focus on their lobbying issue. So the voice of the independent is never heard. Uh, well, it's not, not usually heard. And that's, that's taken up to UN as well. It's so the, UP, the framework for conventional climate change is that institutions are registered body under that framework. Yeah. I think we're the only actual independent professional body to be registered. The next question, actually, um, you talk about going to Europe and um, working with the UN, but what other activities do you do um, abroad? And do you target any specific markets where you know there's going to be certain issues that come up? As you mentioned um, working with or in a conference with someone from America, the Garden Group, and the Union, do you target? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's a target, but we do get involved in certain themed issues. The ob obvious one is, 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 is flooding, um, but partly because of the fact that that's been now quite heavily influenced by the way the climate is changing. So you're talking about the, ver the variability of patterns, and there's a lot of expertise sitting in the UK that can be shared. Um, we're going to <coughs> Poland this, this year through the, our rivers and coastal group to look at a range of issues around flooding and coastal erosion. Um, and in previous years, we've, we've actually been over in New Orleans talking about the Water Environment Federation events. And more recently, we've been in Australia and New, and in particular, but also New, New, New Zealand, looking at how you manage extreme weather events and what this means. The other target that we sort of had is the fact that where we've got uh, enough of a group of membership in a particular country, what do we do with those? Um, in, in some countries, it's the, they're way too large to set up a branch, but how do we set up a network that works and functions? And we're starting to do this in Australia and New Zealand at the moment, and using those models in, in other parts of the world. How do you recruit the international uh, customers? Or, is it, or historically, how do you make Generally, by doing the conference and then people join or the universities? It, 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 it's generally through members who are qualified working in those areas and then seeing a need for qualification because 
there, there aren't many qualifications aside from academic qualifications within the environmental sector outside of Europe. And one of the things we've also done is, is through our link to the Engineering Council, there are a course that the Engineering Council signs up to that gives us the um, what is it, mutual recognition of yes. CN, yes. Um, for example. So um, the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers will be signed up to that, but we're signed up as an individual body as well. That in Hong Kong, if you're a chartered engineer and a chartered course for environment management, you can go into the Hong Kong Institution of Engineers as environmental division, civil division, mechanical division. Yeah. Yeah. Taking that a little bit further, do you actually have a breakdown that we could access of the segmentation of your membership, not just by the ages, the other things we talked about, but by which country they're based in? We can do which country and which subject anyway. Right. In which case, would you know off the top of your head, are there particular countries, you mentioned Australia and New Zealand as being uh, two fairly large, are, are they the only large ones? And what sort of percentage? You talk about 10,000 yeah. members. Are we talking 20, about 20%? 20% <coughs> 20 based outside the UK. Ah, right. um, because of our history, it will not surprise you to know that typically the membership outside the UK has come from the Commonwealth countries. Yeah. Um, that's beginning to change. There's a lot more interest in the Middle East, there's a lot more interest in what we term as Eastern, Eastern Europe. Right, as well as this developing and changing. What about the Americans? There's, there's some interest, in, there's some interest in, in, in the Americans, but it's not large. And, and they have their own bodies as well. Particularly in the US, they, they've not just got their own national bodies, they've got their own federal bodies. And, and, uh, and sometimes not the easiest thing to be able to do. Where there's a global gap is in South America even though quite a lot of our members have worked on projects in, in parts of Latin America and the Caribbean, and more recently two or three of them have been working on projects in, in Brazil. But our links to the professional organisations that has been almost non-existent. Um, in terms of international development as well, um, you mentioned the Urban Drainage Group. Um, they have been to Canada, I think, in discussions with Canada as an example, to deliver training. Our Urban Drainage Group um, deliver training on the, the techniques and modelling and application of knowledge. Um, and they've been to Hong Kong to do that. They've done it in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and there's also been interest from Canada. So through the expertise of our members that contribute to these groups, there, there are invitations to do things overseas as well, um, quite often funded by local bodies. And it's, and it's looking like, and I, I don't just want to focus on one particular group, but it's it's beginning to look like the Urban Drainage Group has a standard, a framework. And basically, if you complete this framework, um, you, are, you are effectively um, not an expert, but you have a certain level of expertise in terms of urban drainage, particularly sustainable urban drainage. It's beginning to look as though that framework will become a standard. It, 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 it already is in the UK, and it's starting to be adopted in other, other countries now. Tom, Tom mentioned Canada. They've approached us to take it as a standard. Australia and New Zealand, and we're beginning to see interest in the Middle East. Now, we've not done anything, it's just the interest has grown and developed, and people are aware of it. But they see that as being actually <coughs> a standard to adopt as a minimum. Is that your own standard? It, in, in effect, it will, be, it will be our own standard, yeah. And, then, and that's something that's emerged that we would never have thought of as that, that being anything that we could do. You talk about these links with. Other, other professional groups in other places. Um, from what you've been saying, what comes across to me as a potential strength, I need mean, to test whether it is, is your ability to work with other professional bodies. You've got your chapter status and so on. Um, would that same, would there be any reason why you can't use those same skills to link with the professional bodies like yours overseas? Um, in other countries and try and get, as the National Trust do, they have joint membership <coughs> and one you also access to membership with, with others. You've got those sort of skills in place with the engineers and so on. What's stopping you from doing it uh, overseas? Or are you? If we, we are. You are trying to it's, 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 there's nothing to stop us. Yeah. The, it, it, the, part, part of it will come down to <coughs> financing this joint membership. 
Um, engineering is globally recognized. Chartered scientists and chartered environmental professional is uh, quite a number of years behind the same process. Um, and what we're trying to do as an institution is say, if you're a chartered engineer through us, a chartered environmental professional has been assessed in exactly the same way. Peer reviewed, interviewed, we've asked for your reports, we've looked at your competence profile. So the status against which you've been assessed is exactly the same. Yeah, standard. no, I was looking at the so it's water management, similar buildings to yourself. But, in but that's, that's where we can start to go. I mean, what, we are actually weirdly unique in this context, in that other bodies around the world are just uh, groupings of environmental people in that sector that don't necessarily have professional standing and status. They've not gone down that with a professional group. And that's something we're looking to try and improve if we can. But, but if you were doing it via those other bodies, yeah. you've got a, a base there, sort of relying on just a network of an individual, that network becomes a whole body, um, whatever that membership happens to be. So, uh, one question that I've never quite had a proper answer to in my own mind is, if we start doing this in a partnership arrangement, could we franchise that local organisation to do things for us, even offer our charterships, and what would that mean? And it's, and it's emerged more recently because um, you may or may not know, there's a body called NEBOSH and they set the national health and safety standards. Um, uh, not, not just in the UK now, but across different parts of the world. They've introduced an environmental management certificate and diploma, in fact, it's been introduced a few years ago. And we're now working with them, so people qualifying from those courses are recognised ways of membership. But they deliver through partners from different parts of the world, and they've got a structure about how they do this. And it's made me start to revisit, could we franchise? Because we can have a partnership with an MOU, but my experience of MOUs is that they don't offer very much. And it's an individual to individual thing, so what can we do differently? And that would mean we take a different direction. We do something we haven't done before. Um, It's, it's, it's a mixture. That, that would, to, to be honest with you, I, I think there's personally been a gap in the pre-university group. One of, we've, we've recently set up an education network, partly because we have a, I mentioned the water initiative, and we're trying to get schools involved in this initiative because if they complete a project under it, the project ticks lots of boxes for key stage two, three and four. And also, being a water project, it ticks the boxes of science, technology, engineering, and maths, the classic STEM subjects. Now, I think if you start getting people involved at that younger age group, they, they, they stay with you. So I see a target really as being 14, 15, right the way through up to sort of 40 as being a, a group we should really do more with. Um, and that, that, would be an, that would be a target, but at the same time, not ignoring the people who retire. Because the ones that retire have got a knowledge of a skills base that I don't think we effectively make use of yet. How can we bring them back in to do things to help us? It's funny enough, that's one of the initiatives that we're putting in place. And interestingly, we were actually trying to get New Zealand <laughs> initially yeah. um, to see how it works on a smaller scale because we don't want to start with the, the grand scale and finish up doing another thing that we, we can't do. So we've got, I think, five or six mentors in New Zealand, um, where there, there has been this need to have these environmental qualifications. Um, we do it within companies, so you're probably familiar with training agreements with ICD structures. We do something similar for Cywem specifically, and we do have these mentoring programs. Um, and the success rates at interview are much better with the mentor than with that. Um, so it is something that we've, we've mailed out to all of our members who are professionally qualified, so who would like to help with this. Um, so I think the next stage is to um, devolve the power to the branches because the biggest problem is you can have someone in Huddersfield but the person needs is force down in Truro in Cornwall. So if you can get the South West branch to do it, um, they don't have to travel halfway across the country as they actually want to meet. So that's that's another initiative that this scattergun approach that we work with.
Uh, <coughs> uh, are, are you doing these activities uh, actively or passively? Uh, it's more passively, it's more reactive. So uh, what's going on? The, the new application process and looking at how, when someone applies to get them into membership, that was very proactive. That's now in place. Uh, in terms of actually going out and gaining members, it tends to be someone uh, who gives us an opportunity and will say, oh, yeah, we'll come and we'll talk to you. So it's, uh, he's trying to, to, to do it. So, so the mental program is becoming part of it. Yeah, the mental program is part of it. Do you think this is kind of uh, marketing uh, activities of, of your, <coughs> yours? And, uh, uh, what we're doing are actually marketing activities themselves. Yeah, uh, or, or uh, other marketing activities. Uh, and uh, which we could, uh, you, uh, you think could be the most effective way? Yeah, there's the, the one area where I think we could be much more proactive is in terms of um, issues. So if we do a press release and we get a phone call from a newspaper or TV or something, we ought to be able to jump straight in and have somebody talk, talk to the press, the radio or the TV. And we don't do enough of that. Um, and that gets... What that does is start, just starts to get our name known, but it starts to get the issues known as well. And people become more and more interested in the subject. And we're not very proactive in there, but we're talking about a lot of issues that are very relevant to the, to the, to the all, all of the press and media. Um, you say that you want to get like more students um, more from their mission, and you're also looking to add value to the members. We've, we've taken a slightly different approach. We've recently launched an environmental careers website that we're trying to link to um, skills gaps and also jobs on our website as well. So we're trying to create initially an electronic platform where someone can see, uh, I've graduated from chemistry in the environmental sector, I can do this. Here's our jobs market where there is an entry level job position on that type of field. Um, we did have a bit of a brainstorming session within our, our, our board and our recruitment as well, um, and our, our, our different colleagues. Um, it was things like, how, how do we best do that with the breadth of our industry that we're trying to deal with? You know, if we, is it better to go to one university and say, we can get people in to talk about their careers in this area, or is it better to so like speed dating in some of the places? There's going to be 20 employee, employers there, and you get three minutes to talk to each employer about what they do. Um, so, we're very much at the embryotic stage of having ideas, we, we, we're not sure how we're going to take them forward, but the careers website is live, the jobs market is live, it's about ways of getting them closer linked and actually engaging with companies that employ graduates, because quite a lot of the jobs on our website at the moment are principal engineer or principal scientist or principal policy advisor, which are maybe five, six years into a career rather than, okay, graduated, what are the graduate schools made? Okay, well, I think we're going to have to sort of draw to a close because we've only got the room till quarter past for one thing. Um, so I think, first of all, uh, we uh, just thank uh, Tom and uh, all the other uh, users. Uh, I'm sure you will have other questions. Uh, rather than everybody emailing direct, it might be an idea if you direct them through Ron and I, so that we can filter, not the questions, but so you're only being asked once or twice, rather than have lots of people asking the same sort of thing. Um, the other intentions that I have, uh, hopefully with Ron's help, uh, I'm going to try and put together, um, that's okay, uh, a list of the, Things that we were asked for, I've noted a few of them as we've gone down. And we will put on to the other website, uh, I'll, I'll build something in there so that information for your assignment is available there. 